so just to give a sense of um, what it is that I, I wanted to talk about, especially coming sort of later on the agenda where you've heard a lot about other programs in which there's a lot of similarities to our program, so I don't want to kind of beleaguer a point or repeat myself, is talk a little bit about uh, this idea of, of transdisciplinarity, what it kind of genuinely means, and uh, what we're maybe seeing instead of transdisciplinarity in many cases, which I call parallel play for those who have any experience with like developmental psychology, that's often what they talk about when kids sort of want to play with each other, but then they just kind of play next to each other. And, uh, and so in many ways, when we see faculty collaborate, they seem to genuinely like each other, they want to get together, but they're doing their own things just kind of next to each other. And so what does that mean in the broader scope? Um, and then again, in the context of our NRT, in which we are in our second year. So we call our program C2R2. Um, people have made a lot of jokes about R2D2 and all of that. Uh, I don't, it was tough to name. It wasn't exactly my forte in naming, so I let other people do it, and this is what happens. But, um, <laughs> but we're really focusing on uh, coastal climate, risk and resilience, as the title implies. You're seeing here a picture uh, post-Hurricane Sandy, which affected the Northeast Coast quite a bit, and especially a lot of folks in the New Jersey and New York area. And so what you're seeing here is a great deal of flooding. And, uh, and this is perhaps one of our major challenges in the state of New Jersey is, um, is sea level rise. So we've heard a, quite a bit about these kind of grand challenges um, or big, big problems, wicked problems, however you want to frame them, and uh, ours being that of how do we prepare for the change in climate, especially with respect to sea level rise, amongst other things, and how do we help coastal communities become resilient to the increasing forecast of, uh, of natural disaster. And, uh, and so with this comes issues dealing with, um, you know, we've got uh, physics, we've got chemistry, we've got biology at a very, earth science at a very basic level, we've got the social sciences, we've got policy, and then we've got all the kinds of questions within those disciplines, such as atmospheric sciences. Um, we have issues with, uh, you know, even Paleo sciences. I mean, you just kind of go across the board. So you can imagine that we're bringing together what I call everything. Because literally, to deal with these kinds of big challenges, you really need to bring everything to the table. There's nothing that can't be categorized in one way or another. Um, and so we established a trainee program, certificate program, structured similarly to the other programs. Um, and, and a lot of this has to do with how the call for proposals is set up, the kinds of requirements for the program. But what we wanted to do is deal with the students early on versus later on and set them up for um, having ideas to help them establish their research questions, right? So they're not kind of doing their own dissertation research and coming to this project and adding things in. They're sort of being informed, trained within this model from the get-go and integrating it throughout their dissertation research. And uh, so they come in their first year as master's or PhD students and take a series of four courses, which I have listed here, and then they pick electives, and their electives have to be some in the natural sciences, some in socioeconomic systems, some in engineered systems, and we've worked very closely with the multiple graduate programs to find out which of their courses might overlap so that we can come up with suggestions as to what to do when you have programs that are already sort of are asking their students to take a lot of courses, and we're throwing on a bunch more. Um, so we've found ways to help curtail some of that problem. In our project, we are testing ideas and questions with respect to kind of data and data reasoning um, around model of system, system-based modeling. And uh, so the tool that we are using happens to be Mental Modeler, which is something that was created by a former graduate student and myself to help 
take multiple pieces of systems knowledge from multiple levels at multiple scales and try to put it together on a single page. The idea is to kind of lessen that cognitive load that we all experience when we're trying to think about multiple moving parts at once. This helps, I argue, students to reason, to think about these complex systems, but on the flip side, it also helps us to assess their reasoning, right? Because it's making some of their thinking visible. And so that's been sort of the strategy we've used. And for those of you who are familiar with graduate education or undergraduate education, or maybe some of what uh, Laura was talking about this morning, we see within undergraduate models quite a bit of sort of pedagogical research or certain I don't know what it is, maybe a community of practice around pedagogical research at the undergraduate level that is not as obvious at the graduate level. So having me come in and say to my colleagues, you know, how are we going to frame your course? What kinds of pedagogical approaches are you going to use when they're saying, well, these are graduate students, I usually just talk to them. And they're going to write it all down and, and learn stuff and come back and give it to us later or something like that to kind of go into there and say, no, 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 we're going to look at how students are, are thinking about these things sort of differently and structure and frame our courses around a pedagogical model. And so that was something that kind of went over like a lead balloon, to be honest. And, uh, um, but we're working on it and we're getting there. The other thing that's kind of gone over like a lead balloon, believe it or not, is this notion of transdisciplinarity. And so, um, you see the multiple programs that are engaged in our uh, C2R2 program, right? And, uh, and so we've discussed with people when we were writing the grant and talking to colleagues and talking to faculty members, um, you know, this is, this is what we're thinking about. This is how we view, you know, disciplinarity versus this kind of multidiscipline, interdiscipline, and really transdiscipline, right? We're really creating a, a new thing and people, oh yes, very, very, very excited for that model. Um, but getting there turns out to be a lot harder for people who are more accustomed to thinking in the language of their own discipline. And, uh, and the thing about transdisciplinarity as well is by definition, right, it's stakeholder involved. By definition, we do bring in participation from outside of this sort of I don't know, codified expertise or however we want to refer to that. And so uh, not only do we have to kind of get our act together, but we've got to get it together in such a way that it's inviting to those who are affected by the work that we're doing. And so we've had some success in doing that. Um, we've had our field work, our internships, they're going really well. and. Uh, and so we are bringing people, instead of maybe traveling to Mexico or California or some of these exciting places, they're traveling, you know, four towns over. But, uh, but we're having them, you know, stay overnight in certain places, really sort of embedding themselves in the community. And the community is embracing that at, at a certain level, much more so than maybe some of our service learning kinds of programs that existed before. And I think it is because there is a more genuine interest and collaboration and getting to know the system and the students you know they they know what they're getting into this is a course you're going to be here sort of locked away sequestered at this period of time this kind of thing you're going to be doing and uh, and so that's been really great um, I've been really pleased with how again the towns have taken it in you're seeing some students in in one image sort of drawing out ideas, thinking about some of these problems. In the bottom, that was something that was put on the municipal web page, right? Oh, we had these graduate students come in. This crew of people all came for a meeting. And so it's, it's right there on their, on their sort of front page of their web page. So it's that kind of embracing at this very small scale where we know a lot of decisions are being made when it comes to planning for sea level rise, climate change, things like that. And, uh, and that's very exciting at one level. At another level, you know, when you go to the university brass, the higher ups, and you're like, yes, we've worked with Union Beach, New Jersey. It's this little town of how many different people. You know, it's, it doesn't feel as dramatic, but I argue, you know, heading down to Trenton, the capital city of New Jersey, and sort of encouraging them to set up rules, stormwater planning, things like that, 
we do that until we're blue in the face, but it's not really going to be actualized. We're not really going to do it unless we get people in communities and get communities really thinking about these things. And so um, we're doing a lot of educating on the part of our university deans, on the part of decision makers in Trenton to say it's land use decisions are made on municipal levels. We got to get into municipalities sort of one at a time, and we've got to get to where they're congregating and where they're at and sort of building from there. And that's where we know a lot of our scientists have the least amount of experience, right? They, there's a lot of training available to how do you talk to a lawmaker? How do you talk to, you know, go down, New Jersey's not far from DC. You know, how do you get down there and talk to Congress and put things in a message bite? But that's not the same as talking to somebody who's responsible for making a decision within a, a municipality that has no expertise to be making that decision. And that's where a lot of decisions are made, right? People are elected to, to boards. They don't have to say, well, I'm a you know, card-carrying environmental scientist or something. They're just an, an, a concerned citizen. And so um, it's an exciting opportunity to educate a public who is motivated but not necessarily trained. And, uh, and the students really seem to eat that up. Um, in a way that sometimes, you know, they're teaching undergraduates in some of their classes who are maybe have more background but are less motivated. So here they get to talk to people who have a lot less background but are really, really do want to hear what they have to say. That being said, this challenge of sort of transdisciplinarity and what it means to sort of, on the part of faculty, to say, yes, my student will be researching this problem that's inherently transdisciplinary, which means that my student may be co-advised by somebody else. It means that my student's going to think about research and seek publication and want to present at conferences that I've never heard of, right? And so it's how I think about my student and where, it, where that person goes out into the world that um, has been a little challenging on the part of certain faculty where they say, well, okay, they can devote a chapter of their dissertation to this. But then they really got to get to the serious stuff. And I think that they don't quite realize that that kind of framing, even though you're saying you support this and we require them to support it, obviously we don't admit students into the program who don't have that support from their advisor, but the support in many ways appears to be lip service rather than true genuine investment. And so it's really hard for individuals to recognize what that looks like or for them to say, Oh, I thought they were doing transdisciplinarity because, you know, they have a little bit of social science and a primarily ecological dissertation or something like that, and saying, well, that's not quite the same thing. And maybe some of the findings out of what they're doing may not be publishable in that kind of peer review space that you're talking about. It may actually help them to get a job because, you know, if it's going to be a white paper for the Forest Service or something like that, that might be more valuable to the student, but it's not going to look like the same kind of reward structure that you're accustomed to. And so, um, you know, a lot of the faculty, so a lot of this information is coming from interviews with faculty and students. And a number of them said, you know, I need more training in this. I, I didn't expect it to be this hard. I didn't expect these questions to be this hard. And for me to say, well, you know, it's not, it's not like there's a manual. You know, I mean, there are guides. There are manuals. In fact, the image is from the uh, textbook on transdisciplinarity. But it's not going to be tailored to their specific needs. That a lot of us need to figure it out as we go along. There's a space for flexibility in how we do this that sometimes, you know, I want to say about three quarters of the people who are mentoring students realized how uncomfortable it, they were with this and how they really needed to think about it more and how ill prepared they felt in some ways. Um, and how when a student comes and says, you know what, I know I talked to you about doing this for my dissertation but I've totally decided to scrap the whole idea and I'm gonna do this and bring in this and think about that. And how they, what are those metrics of scholarship? You know, how, if you're gonna really try to m merge multiple disciplines, you need a journal that might accept that paper. And I've certainly, as a transdisciplinary <laughs> scholar, have had some issues where I'm like, no, I want actually the community members to be the lead authors, you know? And, and so what does that look like? And how do you, even to the point of like, 
how do you write up their bio? You know, what university are they from? Which email should they use? Well, they don't actually use an email, <laughs> but they are the ones that really led this process or things like that. So there is a, a lot of this kind of thinking that people, I think, were not quite ready for yet in, in their enthusiasm over the program. And, and with that, when we sort of began to think about the kinds of knowledge, and that's what this representation is showing, how do you actualize that? And, uh, and a lot of that has to do with problem ID. A graduate student right, mentioned that this morning. A lot of, the, I mean, that's like half the battle. You know, we've got a lot of solutions. Um, we just don't know how to apply them. And that's where we're bringing in the public to, to help us use this information. But again, what does it mean to be sort of a scientist now is a challenge that our students are really thinking about. And what does it mean to see results all the way through? And what does it mean to have sort of a vested interest in something versus not? And so a lot of those ideas about objectivity and what, it, what that kind of means as a scientist, when in some ways they're feeling a little bit like an advocate, um, gets hard and it gets messy. And I'm not saying we've discovered in our second year clear-cut answers to that, but what we've discovered is that, again, while things are harder than <laughs> we thought it would be in some level, um, the challenges are really very interesting. It's not, I feared certain challenges like a complete disinterest on the part of faculty, or I feared issues like, all right, we go to the administration and say, we're gonna need a little more space, or we're gonna need a little more of this. And they're still interested, they're still game to work with us. And so that's a good thing. Those are challenges I feared we have and, and we don't. But the challenges are more nuanced than that. And, uh, and it's really caused me to look inward as well um, in terms of what, it, what is my goal with all this? What are we trying to figure out? Is it just a municipality at a time? Are there things we can generalize to bring it at a broader level? What does it mean again to sort of bring in the public? You know, there's issues like citizen science, democratization of science. Um, you know, the, we deal a lot with inclusivity, who should be at the table, who's missing at the table, who's being affected by the decisions that are marginalized, like all these kinds of questions that our students are really not accustomed to, to thinking about, that are gaining that exposure, but we're at this, maybe that painful adolescence where it's like, wow, this is, <laughs> you know, being an adult's a lot harder than we thought, but we, we think we still want to do that. And so how are we going to figure out or navigate our way through that process? We have a lot of future directions. I realized I just was choosing pretty pictures that my friend took uh, around Sandy, but that the future direction, if I could have changed the slides, um, I hopefully is not complete flooding, but uh, <laughs> is, or maybe it is, it's gonna be flooding one way or another, and maybe I should have shown a picture of like retreat and preparation or things like that to show communities that are prepared. But uh, we, we have a lot of goals with this project. One of the goals um, that we certainly wanted to do is bring in more diversity into our programs. And by diversity, we are talking about all aspects of identity, right? We're talking about people who aren't normally there, whether they're people of color, whether they are people who are first generation, whether they're people who traditionally have gone or thought about problems this way, coming in and doing that kind of thing. We want, we want that creativity at the table. But that also takes explicit awareness of who's bringing what, identifying that, learning how to value that, and, and negotiating that process forward. That being said, um, it's been a little tough. I talked to my table about that. Uh, New Jersey isn't, the, you know, Rutgers University is not quite urban, uh, but it's not quite suburban. And so uh, students, when we bring them out and they visit us, sometimes they don't like it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, New York City offers a lot of appeal. It's, it's close, but there's a lot of schools doing similar kinds of things there. Um, so why not just go there if you want to be in a nice metropolitan area? Or, um, or, you know, just avoid the whole crowded thing altogether where, you know, the cost of living is twice the that which you'd expect. Um, and so sometimes we have to say, well, we're bringing you into where the problem is. You know, you're going to have a, so while, your living space is going to be really expensive and really small. Um, at least you're starting to view this from what other people 
are viewing it as. But that's that's a little bit hard. And I, I'm not kidding when I say sometimes you know we bring in recruits and it's like don't take them down the turnpike, okay? We're gonna take them on a, maybe a country road or a back road or something like that. Um, and and I've gone. I have a network of historically black colleges and universities through uh, Maryland down into North Carolina that I've worked with personally in the past. And so I've gone there and I'm like, we're going to pick up this student. You just got to come see it, come realize, you know. And it's a, it's a challenge for students, first generation students, to go so far from home, right? I mean, it's, it's a crazy thing. And so to try to get them to decide they want to come to Rutgers, which doesn't necessarily look welcoming. I think another problem we have is Rutgers is a very diverse campus, right? The state of New Jersey just has people coming in from all around the world. We've got a lot of ethnic groups, racial groups, however you want to define people. But I think because of it, the university is a little bit complacent about it, you know, so they maybe don't make clear how they make people feel better, right? Or how, what steps are they taking to bring in different groups of people? I think they just, like, well, they're just here, you know? <laughs> we just put a net around them and we've got diverse groups of people. And so we have no problem recruiting into our program from our undergraduate programs. But I, we want to see a little more creativity. We want to see, we, number one, we want to see our undergraduates get out of this one way of thinking, go see the world a little bit, and we want to bring the world in a little bit. And so that's been somewhat hard. And so we've had to kind of sit down with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion and, and really talk about what kinds of mentorship programs are we going to have where uh, that can be institutionalized so it doesn't look like it's just like come to you know Rebecca's couch and sit where where diversity and inclusion is welcomed and everywhere else you can't find it. And so um, we've had a real challenge in that way. We currently are meeting our goals, but it has been a lot of like, maybe even a little begging to me, like just give it a shot, just give it one year. You know, I think you realize that it isn't, it isn't so harsh an environment and that there is a lot we can offer you. Um, that being said, I think, uh, as Fred mentioned, I'm. The other challenge that I'll personally face is that I won't be at Rutgers next year, so I've taken a position at Michigan State University, but I'm very committed to our program and, and intend to continue running that in New Jersey, but then I have an opportunity to look at graduate training models from a broader scope, and so I am excited to do that. But I was hoping at this point in our grant cycle, especially let me on our program officer, that we'd have a lot more. Um, great things to say, but I do think that in this process of research, we're really beginning to see the problems and we're really beginning to frame the questions that we need to, to frame around this kind of graduate training in a much more intensive way. So I think it couldn't have been done without the funding. And I think by the time our funding, you know, by the time we're up for renewal or other sources of funding, I think we're going to be much better prepared. But, um, compared to Eigert's and Gans and other things that people have had and have supported at Rutgers, this one I think for a lot of people was more challenging than they had thought because of this sort of stakeholder engaged, because of the diversity and inclusion issues, because of transdisciplinarity that they never had to think about before. Again, for me, very exciting. This is, this is what we're all about and this is what NSF and these organizations, I think they want us to get into these, these real grand challenges, but, um, but I think it's going to take a couple more years before we have some strong insight as to at least one way around that. So thank you. <laughs>